Coming up on Tech News Today, my BlackBerry Playbook has a new operating system. We'll talk all about just how late it is. Also, Comcast squaring off against Netflix, maybe. And Microsoft Office might be coming to the iPad. We've got pictures. All that and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, February 21st, 2012. Mardi Gras. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Get better connected to the people you depend on for success. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com, promo code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And joining us today, Mark Million, author of Letters to Steve... You can find out more about it at markmillion.com, I would presume. Is that right, Mark? Yeah, that's right. What's up, guys? Good to have you back, man. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, good to see you guys. So uh, let's jump right in with the BlackBerry Playbook 2.0, the best operating system of 2009, finally arriving on the BlackBerry Playbook today. <laughs> there you can tell it's so much different because, look, it's got email, contacts. It's called messages, but it's, yeah, messages, contacts, and calendar, which I have to say really works well i uh i i synced it up with my gmail and all i did was put in my my password and my email address it synced my calendar it synced my contacts seamlessly i can put in twitter it's a unified inbox they also have a video store now so that whole video playback is not as useless as it used to be you can get uh you can get movies like um phantom of the opera project nim johnny english reborn Okay, so all this sounds great, except that I think pretty much everybody who either has a playbook, those, those movies uh, sound great to you, or consider it. <laughs> well, I'm saying I'm saying a lot of the updates with native email right. and that sort of thing, but that's that was all s- should have been in the original OS. It's exactly. It right. was a big update. It was over 500 megabytes. It took about 40 minutes to download on our Wi-Fi here. Uh, it, it got stuck on 18 percent for a good five minutes. I'm not sure exactly what was interesting about between 18 and 19 percent, but it was a big. These things happen. <laughs> but yeah, so 500 megabytes of an operating system that wasn't included when they when they shipped it in the first place. There's also update to BlackBerry Bridge. If you have a BlackBerry phone, uh, you can now display documents, web pages, emails, and photos that appear on your smartphone easily on your playbook. Uh, the phone can also be used as a wireless keyboard. And uh, Android apps uh, now work on the playbook. Wow, so I can just access the Android marketplace right from my playbook? This really mm, opens it up. No, no, oh. you can't do that. Oh. Um, you can uh, wait for a developer to take his gingerbread app mm-hmm. and gingerbread only. repackage it into a BAR file format and submit it to the App World Store, though. Okay, so get on that. Of yeah. well, that, and those apps may not be able to access all the APIs that they would be able to access on Android normally. So you might even get more limited functionality of the Android apps you get on Playbook. And to entice developers to do this, they're not allowing them to bring their free apps over that uh, that are uh, paid for by ads. So that's cool. Just Mar- saying. Mark, can you say anything nice about the Playbook? Because I think we're being a little snide here. I don't know. How much is the thing now? Is it less than a I've seen it one seventy at some places, one ninety nine in most places. One ninety nine I think is the the normal price these days, yeah. So it's come okay. down quite mm-hmm. a bit since I bought mine. The guts are very similar to a Kindle Fire, right? So it's just tough. They they came out early. They came they beat Amazon, but they didn't, you know, have a full product. It took them eight months to get an email client. And this is the productivity company, RIM. It's, uh, it's a tough sell. Also, I hate to point this out, um, but it's not BlackBerry Messenger compatible. In fact, it's not even BlackBerry Enterprise Server compatible, the, the playbook. It just gets your email using Exchange Well, you Exchange accepted that when server. you bought it the first point, that mm. it was pretty it much... It didn't not, have email. It didn't have a whole lot of things. So you always had your BlackBerry uh, phone and you had your playbook. So you could always access that stuff on your phone. That's, that's how it works. I'll tell you, my, my bottom line is BlackBerry Playbook OS 2.0 is excellent for those of you who are using a BlackBerry Playbook every day because it adds a lot of things that you needed. And... That was nice. Yeah. 
that yeah. if you it can't say has, anything it, it, it nice, is a, it is a big improvement. It still has two more cameras than the Kindle Fire. I mean, that's that's something <laughs> there. Uh, they didn't include that. It actually it maxes out two ninety nine now. It actually does make a great e reader, and you can you can use Kobo's uh, app to read, or you, you can use Kindle on the web on that. Kindle on the web, I have that. Installed is it is as well. it weird that they went with Gingerbread for Android apps rather than Honeycomb, which is more of the tablet it's, OS? It's not they went they didn't go with it. That's just what that kit that they're using to port I supports. I read somewhere uh-huh. that when, when Ice Cream Sandwich is open sourced, and I don't know if that's already now that might have happened, yeah. that's when apps for, for ICS will be supported on on the, the playbook. But Right, well, Google never open sourced uh, Honeycomb. Honeycomb, right? That's right, because that was pretty much a hack to work on tablets. So, And it's still real multitasking. This is the best multitasking on a tablet I have ever seen. It is the closest to what I want to be able to do with multitasking on a tablet. It's just all these other things that it doesn't have and, and, and can't make use of. That Did have been you see the, uh, the touchpad multitasking is pretty nice, but... Uh Nobody bought that until it was lowered to 100 bucks. Why is it that so the, they, the lower you, end of tablets have the best multitasking? Yeah, well, you, you can multitask, but there's not a whole lot of things you can do with it, so it yeah. doesn't really matter. Uh, let's move on to another tabletish device that got an upgrade today. Barnes & Noble had their earnings call and at the same time announced new versions of their Nook. Uh, there is a new Nook tablet that will be $199 with 8 gigabytes of memory. So it's $50 cheaper than the 16 gig version of the Nook tablet. That 16 gig is still available for $250. But the Nook tablet for 199 pretty much matches up against the Kindle Fire with a better screen and some say a better interface uh, for the same price and with the same storage capacity as the Kindle Fire. They also dropped the price of the Nook Color, which was $199. So if you're going to have a Nook tablet that's $199, you kind of have to drop the price of the Nook Color. The new Nook Color e-reader, or the new price of the Nook Color e-reader is $169. All of this at the same time that they announced uh, that they saw sales rise 5% year over year for the fourth quarter. Now, don't forget the Barnes & Noble fourth quarter crosses through the holidays and into the spring college buying season, Mm -hmm. which is a big deal for Barnes & Noble being a bookseller. So this is probably their best quarter of the year, uh, usually. Profit fell 14% from a year ago to 52 million or 71 cents a share. Uh, Retail store sales up 2%, online sales up 32%. Sales of the Nook in all its form uh, up 38%. And get this, digital purchases, which include not only ebooks but also apps that they sell through the Nook app store, up 85%. So CEO William Lynch said uh, that apps are the company's fastest growing content area. And within apps, it's entertainment, movies, Netflix, games, kids. They're going to keep pushing that. They also say they haven't had a busier store, either online or in person, In five years is the busiest they've been. Of course, part of that is because borders went belly up. So where else are people going to (laughs) go? Um, They're still looking at substantial losses for the fiscal year, though, between a buck 10 and a buck 40 per share. So this is not really Barnes and Noble saying, ah, Amazon got us with the fire. We lost and now we have to bow down to their specs. This is just them saying, well, if the if the Kindle fire was a lot more attractive to you in price and 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 uh, and the amount of memory, we'll just give you another option. Yeah, they they said that they hold 30% of the e-reader market. So, yeah, my guess is they looked at that and said, well, we're doing okay. If we had something that went head-to-head with the Fire, though, we might do even better. Barnes & Noble had a leap over the Kindle Fire for a long time with the Nook Color. I mean, that was the... The, the Android tablet that people seem to love before the Fire was like, oh, yeah, there's there's this option we have. We can sideload this. People were hacking it like crazy, trying to get the Nook to do a lot more things. And with them finally reducing the price to one ninety nine direct, I mean, they have that good brand name of the Nook. People know the Nook already. It was successful before. There's no reason for it to not continue its success. Mark, can you think of uh, what Barnes & Noble lacks still in their fight with Amazon now that they match up? directly you know comparatively with hardware well um lynch's stat about apps being the fastest growing business is kind of a throwaway piece of data because none of the nooks played apps before you know about a year ago so the fact that they're selling a lot of apps maybe that's promising maybe they're selling a decent amount of nooks and it's growing high as a percentage um but amazon came out late after after the Nook Color and the Nook Tablet, and they came out with a full ecosystem and they had everything together packaged as one. And, and really on the service side and the marketplace side, um, 
Amazon came the closest to to trying to match Apple. Um, they built on what Google already had, and and Barnes and Noble is not that kind of company, and they haven't established themselves as as that kind of company. And their bookstore still doesn't match the number of books in Amazon's, and and fair Apple's iBook store doesn't match Amazon or even Barnes and Noble. But you can at least get the Amazon bookstore on your Nook. So the Nook, tr- I mean, Barnes and Noble trying to fight it out as its own, um, you know, trying to be a player in this in this world of digital media and digital technology is not their home court and it's going to be a tough fight for them yeah i mean you're absolutely right about the ecosystem that it's one thing our chat room has been you know raging about they're like but amazon has it all they have the video they have the books they have the shipping they have everything barnes and noble has some of those pieces but not all of them what barnes and noble does have is a physical store where you can go in and you can get help if you're a uh, you know a newbie you can go in and look at the thing and pick it up and play with it how much of an advantage do you think that is over the kindle well, I I fly in airports and I go into those bookstores there, and Amazon has cut a deal with somebody because I see Kindles at the front of the at the front of the store, and I see people playing around with them and considering, oh, well, I could take this onto the plane. So, and I see uh, Kindles and Best Buys and all stores that seem to be doing better foot traffic than Barnes and Noble. Um, I don't know how much of an advantage Barnes and Noble having a brick and mortar operation is going to be, but here we have Amazon rumors, uh, them talking about maybe opening their own uh, pilot store in Seattle and maybe others. So we'll see. Maybe maybe brick and mortar is worth more than I think it is. And Apple has proved that it's helped their business. So I guess we'll see. All right, let's move on to a raging rumor out there. Microsoft Office for iPad. We've talked about this a little bit, but there's a lot more to talk about today. Yeah, today we have a we have like a three part story arc and we got the beginning, we got the middle, we got we even have an epilogue. So this is gonna be fun. Let's let's go through the ride here. <laughs> Tell us a story. So the Daily reported that Microsoft is going to submit Office for iPad really soon for Apple's App Store approval. Okay, that sounds interesting. Daily said they're working prototype of this, saying the interface is kind of like OneNote. It's kind of got this Metro look. This version of Office would have Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and files could be created and edited locally and online. And they also mentioned at the Daily that there's no Android version. This is the part that nobody seems to be arguing about, the Android version. The initial reaction is the Verge is like, yeah, well, we, we understand that the Microsoft Mac business unit is working on Office for iPad. Mary Jo Foley over at, at, at ZDNet mentioned, hey, look, this sounds a lot like the stuff that's coming out for Office 15 for Windows on ARM. So why not have the same kind of thing? But Ars Technica started poking holes in this, saying that they couldn't confirm with its sources that uh, there is Office for iPad. They also noticed there was no Mac business unit branding on the screenshot. They also noticed that it was a little strange for an application in the fact that there were three apps in one. Why would Office be this one, this one place for three applications? So Microsoft got sick of all this and actually responded. So this is the third party. Microsoft spokesperson contacted Mary Jo Foley and said the screenshot accompanying the Daily Story is not a picture of a real Microsoft, uh, Microsoft software product. Then the spokesperson said Microsoft is declining to comment as to whether the company has developed a version of Office for iPad and or when such a product may come to market. And there's a quote to All Things D, the daily story is based on inaccurate rumors and speculation. We have no further comment. So what about the daily? What, what, what do they have to say about this? Yeah, what does Peter Ha say, have to say about Peter that? Peter Ha talked to TechCrunch. He's saying, quote, we've been chasing this story down for weeks. We did not fabricate the image and Microsoft is, isn't denying the existence of Office for iPad. All this fuss over a photo is nonsense. The story is real. So what I think is going on is Microsoft can say, technically, this is not a picture of a real Microsoft product because you're looking at a prototype and it might change a little bit, but they're not denying that they're working on this. And the Daily probably does. Have, I mean, they've got something that's as legitimate as it can be today. It's just, I mean, it's just the, it could be a prototype. It could not, I mean, the, the Daily called it a prototype. So it's, I think everyone's technically correct this is, right It's now. like everyone's a sort of little semantics thing. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with Sarah on this. I think uh, it's just PR trying to spin a yarn um, trying to, you know, play with semantics, like you said, Tom. It's, it, I think the Daily's reporting is probably pretty solid on this. Isn't it a little strange that Microsoft even responded at all? I mean, normally they just go, we don't, pro- we don't comment on future products, and then they just, that's the end of their current statement. Why, why have they reached out and mentioned to people, look, that's maybe not just a real because product. people are picking it apart so much that Microsoft has sort of an out if someone's like, well, this looks like a bunch of junk. What a terrible mock-up. They can <laughs> say, all, hey, this is not what it's going to look like. 
This is also, um, you know, Office is their cash cow. It's their biggest business. And this could really scare shareholders to think that Microsoft, which, you know, was basing its its upcoming business around its tablet software and, and porting Windows to tablets and that being the big new initiative for them, and the idea that they would go and release their biggest product for the prime competitor that they're going to be fighting in the in the coming year um, could, you know, significantly damage their stock. So they they would want to nip this rumor in the bud as soon as possible and say no. We we, or at least kind of imply that they have no plans to release it immediately or at least before Windows Eight comes out. I, I do look at this screenshot, and I don't doubt that Peter Ha is not lying. I don't. I don't think he's lying about it. But I do. He's think not it's that a, good with Photoshop. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> I, I just don't think. I look at it. and I'm like, God, it just looks weird. It doesn't. It doesn't say anything about Office for Mac. It's got three apps in there. None of those things mean that it couldn't be still true. Uh, it absolutely could. But there's something about it that seems odd to me. I mean, theoretically, that also means that Office would be a unified. Application, which it could be, I guess. I mean, you do that with Google Docs, right? You open it, you go, "Hey, Docs, okay, I want either new spreadsheet, new document, new whatever presentation." It would be nice. I mean, as someone using a tablet to have it all in one for for Google Docs. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, and even Apple splits apart its uh, Google. I'm sorry, Microsoft Office uh, equivalents too, and they sell them separately. Right. But Microsoft does not. They always sell Office as one package, right? Whether that's it true. be the home version or the pro version, um, maybe they're that's that's their solution for um, you know the a la carte model that they want to fight against. They don't want you to just buy Word if you only think you're in need Word. They want you to buy a huge package of Word and Excel and Outlook and I don't know if Outlook's in there, but you know whatever whatever you might need that's part of the tablet. Sounds like a product. cable service. Just buy this exactly. tier for and everything. Cable makes a lot of money. <laughs> the triple play. You're right. We're Solves getting all to your that problems. In a minute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor, GoToMeeting. You know, uh, we always trust people we know. That's just natural, right? Then people you don't know, strangers can do all kinds of weird things. Uh, that is a tough hurdle in business, though. You need to get to know your employees and your clients when you're running a worldwide business or, or at least doing business around the world. That's why we recommend go to meeting with HD Faces by Citrix. A simple online meeting service with group HD video helps you get better connected to the people you depend on for success. And with go to meeting, it doesn't take a lot. Just a webcam and a click of the software to collaborate in group with HD video. You can see your attendees eye to eye while collaborating on documents in real time it helps build that trust and that confidence uh, that is so hard to replicate when you're meeting online and it makes your meetings more effective go to meeting is easy to set up and use that's why we love it and the video quality is clear and natural it's like being in the same room because you have hd video and don't have to pick a side. Available for Mac or PC. You can use GoToMeeting for product reviews and demos, sales presentations, training sessions, status meetings. And you don't even have to get up out and leave your desk. You don't have to put on pants. You can just stay there the whole time. Start hosting your own face-to-face online meetings today with GoToMeeting. Go to GoToMeeting.com and try it for free by entering the promo code TNT. So click on that Try It Free button and enter the promo code TNT. You get to try it out for 30 days. You don't have to take any of the things that I just said and you can wear pants. Go to meeting.com. TNT is the code, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Onward into the avalanche of video-on-demand services, starting with Comcast. Are they actually taking on Netflix? Well, okay. The headlines would lead you to believe that, and their new service is called Stream Picks. With an X. Stream Quickster. Did you say Netflix? Stream Quickster. Stream Picks. Stream Picks. Porn. Now, now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've signed up for Stream Picks. It's going to be a fun weekend. <laughs> Stream Picks is a subscription VOD service from Comcast that requires a Comcast subscription. So already this is not like Netflix because Netflix is, you know, works for people who have cut the cord. Stream Picks will not. Now, I originally said, well, when I had Comcast... Isn't this like Xfinity VOD service where I could watch stuff on demand? Yes, it is just like that, except that now it includes a lot more flexibility, such as watching uh, video on demand out of your home, whereas before you would have to watch it via your cable box in your living room or wherever it was set up. So via your PC, mobile devices, TVs, it's free for anybody who subscribed to Comcast Triple Play Package. 
If you haven't, if you have one of their lower tiers, it's、uh, $5 a month on top of whatever plan you already have, which goes, I mean, it's, it's falling in line with what Comcast CEO Brian, Ro- Brian Roberts、uh, told the Wall Street Journal about a year ago. Who said, we're not looking to launch a service that's available to people who don't subscribe to us. What, we're, what, what, what they're doing is trying to provide just a better service for the people who are already giving them money. So, in that sense, hey, if you're a Comcast subscriber, this could be a good deal for you. But anybody who isn't isn't going to get anything. It's out a of this. retention play. It、exactly. says, hey, here's another thing. But I wonder that it's not too many things because when you looked at it, you're like, wait, I already get this.、Mm-hmm. So, how many Comcast subscribers who don't get this for free as part of their triple play are going to call up Comcast and say, hey, I want that new thing? Or how many are just going to think, well, I think I already have that? You know, and, and also when you want to watch something, you have to know which service to look for it on. Now you got three different places to look for it. Sure. And it's not everything you can get on Comcast, of course.、Right. It's just with certain partners. And some of the services only work in your house and some don't. That's right.、It's, it seems way too confusing to me. It, it's, it's, it's Comcast trying to say we, we understand that people who pay us、um, want to be able to watch the content in a variety of places. But I can see where, in a, in a certain way, people see this as a competitor to Netflix. Because if I am a Comcast subscriber, I could choose to buy this. For $5 a month instead of Netflix for $8、mm-hmm. a month.、Uh, and Netflix also in competition with Blockbuster, which has some news today. Yeah, so smarthouse.com is reporting that Samsung signed a deal with Blockbuster、uh, for streaming content for smartphones, tablets, smart TVs. They actually have had a deal with Samsung HD TVs with Blockbuster on demand、uh, since 2009, but this is kind of opening it up to Samsung's、uh, you know, entire product line.、Uh, apparently, it's going to be coming to the US and Europe first half of this year, Australia sometime later on in the year. Blockbuster、uh, is still the number one、um, in Australia for movie rental service.、Um, so that's, it makes sense that they would, they would、uh, expand in Australia.、Um, On Demand originally launched in 2008. So you might hear this and think, oh, wow, they're just rolling it out everywhere. And if they got the Samsung deal, they're on the up and up. Although TiVo just announced that their partnership,、um, which started in March 2009 with Blockbuster On Demand, will end on March 31st of this year. And they're joining、uh, previously ended partnerships with Vizio, Western Digital TV Live as well. For whatever reason, Blockbuster On Demand just did not go. So it, it almost seems like, well, Blockbuster and Samsung seem to have a nice. Little partnership here, but it's not really working out with a variety of other services. So, Blockbuster is now becoming available only on Samsung. That looks that that sort of looks、Pretty、like、much. where this is headed. Yeah, it's only Samsung、towards. model HD TVs, for example, Samsung mobile. And Comcast, you have to be a Comcast television subscriber, not an internet subscriber. My guess is Comcast doesn't want to deal with the accusations of possible net neutrality violations. So, they're only offering their streaming service to their television subscribers. So, if I'm Netflix, I'm sitting back going, This is awesome. You know, another、If、thing. This is the kind of competition、yeah. I'm up against. This is, this is great. Yeah, Blockbuster also has another service called Blockbuster Movie Pass.、Um, this is something that the Dish Network launched、um, after they acquired Blockbuster back in October. And this is $10 a month add on for existing subscribers of Dish Network for DVD, Blu ray, video game rentals, streaming movies, and TV. But again, you can't be a Netflix competitor. If you're bundling this in with a dish subscription, which is what, $100 plus. Mark, what do you think is easiest to, to describe of all of these streaming services? <laughs> Oh, uh, it literally <laughs> just dropped. It, right it, when it I made, he was like, I'm out, I can't. He's like, he's like, I can't take this. Maybe, maybe he's, he's like me、oh, right now. Like my, my head's starting、timed. to hurt from just hearing the amount of options you have. And you, you have to basically <laughs> jump through tons of hoops to even know if you can access one of these services in the first place. Comcast has got a, I guess they've got their own kind of model, whatever they want to do there. Blockbuster making it very hard to get content that、mm-hmm. you should be able to get. I mean, there was like an oatmeal comic, book,、uh, comic about this, why people end up pirating, because you can't find the content you want. Well,、so、that's, a little, keeps, that's a it, little bit different because HBO is not making it available anywhere. So, yeah, go ahead. Anyway, my point was that if, if you want to compete with Netflix or Amazon, You need to be on as many services as possible. You need to be on, on the TiVo boxes. You need to be on the set top boxes. You need to be on everywhere. So it seems a little, it just seems counterintuitive why it would be so limited. I mean, if you want to go out there and make some money, put out your service, get it available for everybody. Because I mean, Verizon's trying this with their, with their Redbox partnership or their Coinstart partnership. So maybe they'll be the real competitor to Netflix. 
but they don't have DVDs as well. Speaking of Netflix, uh, the company just announced a multi-year deal with the Weinstein Company for U.S. subscribers, at least at first. Um, exclusives for a lot of foreign movies and documentaries, but including uh, movies like The Artist uh, and the documentary Undefeated, both... Uh, very big in, in in the film buzz world. The artist is up for Best Picture and might win on Sunday. I mean, it's up for, I think, 12 Oscar nominations. And worth watching. I, I watched yeah, it this Yeah, it was a great movie. Great movie. Uh, so this, I mean, th- these are the sorts of movies that traditionally would always be first run uh, via some sort of cable service. So as far as Netflix goes, hey, you know, this, this, it's a pretty good get. Um, it's, it's, it's actually good news after recently Netflix had to pay a $9 million, uh, uh, amount to settle a class action lawsuit based on that Video Privacy Protection Act, which it keeps movie streaming services from keeping your data and having to wipe it out. So they had to uh, actually um, go in and update their earnings report for Q4. It was a 14% dip in profits from what it was uh, before this class action lawsuit got settled. So it's it's good news for Netflix. I mean, they're still on the climb back up to where they were post meltdown no, of last no, summer. In, in eight days, they're going to lose stars. So I mean, people will remember that in eight days, and right. they're going to freak out. No, seven what, days. What also days. is going to happen is people are going to get these Comcast and Blockbuster things and go, "Wait, that's just too confusing." You know, I'm going back to that. I, I I forgive Netflix because you know what Netflix did through all of that. You know, blowing off their customers and angering people, they did it horribly. But they came out of it with a very simple off rating. Seven ninety nine for streaming, seven ninety nine for DVDs. You know, I d- and you can argue about how they got there, but in the end, they've got a very simple offering. It's very easy to understand. I agree with you guys that when you read off all uh, all of these options at once, we go, "Wow, that sounds really confusing." But I mean, if you are a Dish Network customer, you love Dish Network, and they and they you know send you something in the mail that says for ten dollars a month you can have all these sorts of things, and you're not particularly you know a, you know a real technical person, you don't have an Apple TV, you don't know, even know what Roku is, I can see this being a really good service. For certain people, especially if they just kind of want to keep it all in the same area. I just, th- I, I think it ends up being too confusing even if you get those services, but it depends yeah. on how they package them, I suppose. Uh, I got a couple more stories before we get to the news fuse to talk about. Microsoft now accusing Google of bypassing privacy protections in Internet Explorer. This is similar to the story we had with Safari and the Safari browser on Friday, but it is a different thing. In fact, I mentioned this P3P policy when I was explaining what was going on with the Safari browser. Dean Hakamovich, Corporate Vice President for Internet Explorer, wrote on a blog today that Google's P3P policy policy is actually a statement that is not a P3P policy. It's intended for humans to read. And then he goes on to say how Google is circumventing Internet Explorer's ability to block tracking cookies just like Google is doing on Safari, except it's not just like what Google was doing on Safari. What's going on here is a 2002 piece of technology from Microsoft is being circumvented by about a third of the websites on the Internet. Uh, Facebook very much like Google, presents a P3P statement that says Facebook does not have a P3P policy. And sadly, what Microsoft does when it reads that is says, okay, well, then you can set all the cookies you want. Uh, So, yeah, you you can say that Google and Facebook and, and, and all of these other websites are not honoring what P3P is supposed to be, but P3P is over 10 years old Mm -hmm. and has been abused for years. And Microsoft never spoke up about it until now. Lori Faith Craner, an associate professor of computer science and of engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University, did a story in 2010, did a study, I should say, in 2010, where she found that of 33,000 websites she surveyed, 11,000 circumvented the P3P policy in Internet Explorer and made that public and said Microsoft should address this. Now, Microsoft today says no one ever told us this was broken. They knew. How? Yeah, that's impossible. Yeah, so I mean, we can we can say Facebook and Google and all these others should not have been going around this. They sh- they should have been making it public that this is broken and trying to get it fixed. Ideally, but again, like we talked about on Friday, when you're an HTML programmer, there are so many things in HTML that don't work the way they're supposed to that you just get used to working around them. I, mean, I don't think Microsoft's ever going to get any sympathy because somebody had to do a workaround for Internet Explorer. I mean, if you've ever designed any web pages and you had to work with IE six. Nobody's going to be like, oh, yeah, Microsoft, poor Microsoft. They were, it seems like they're already immediately vilified because they've had one of the most non standards compliant a browser 
that's the word I want to use there, browser, uh, that, that was out there. If this was like Opera saying something like this, saying, you know what, you guys, we are standards compliant and you guys are working around us. That's not right. It's Microsoft. And they, they have a really bad track, uh, track record when it comes to their browser. And Facebook. This is so obviously Microsoft just piling on Google like they do every time Google gets some privacy dust up or some bad press. Like the same thing they did when uh, Google, you know, condensed its privacy policies and Microsoft came out out of nowhere and was like, this is abhorrent. I can't believe they're doing it. It's just Microsoft sees Google as the prime enemy. And they will just keep coming out of the woodwork with whatever dirt that they have or what they think is dirt to uh, to just come at them. Now, the upshot to, to me is that you should upgrade to IE9 because it doesn't have these P3P problems. It handles privacy in a different way. But that doesn't stop people from filing class action suits. They, Google's got one uh, filed over the circumvention of Safari's privacy features. So this isn't over yet. You can expect to see people getting very upset about this Internet Explorer thing as well. Finally, the NSA director, General Keith Alexander, here in the United States, has, according to a Wall Street Journal report, been telling folks in White House meetings that within a year or two, the anonymous group could have the ability to cause power outages. Now, he has warned publicly about emerging ability by cyber attackers to disable or even damage computer networks. But privately, he's saying we really have to watch out for anonymous. Uh, last week, a group attributing themselves to being part of Anonymous, announced a plan to shut down the internet on March 31st. That was called Operation Global Blackout by attacking the, the DNS root servers. Intelligence officials believe that cyber threats to the power grid are actually relatively limited, that they would have to come from country-level support, something like China or Russia, although they don't really have an incentive to bring down our power grid as much as maybe in North Korea or Iran, but those countries probably don't have the capability uh, what they're really worried about, General Martin Dempsey, actually chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, said to lawmakers at a hearing last week, a near-peer competitor could give cyber malware capability to some fringe group, and then that fringe group might go after our electrical grid. Uh, Anonymous responded to this in, in various blogs and Twitter accounts with incredulity and, and basically just called it fear-mongering, said, well, why would we ever try to shut off the power grid? There are people on life support. There are other vital services that rely on it. That is not something Anonymous would do. NSA is just fear-mongering. I think that uh, um, General Alexander bringing up Anonymous is just a, it, it's a good um, example of here's a group we don't really know where they are. We can't really pinpoint where a lot of the stuff is coming from. S somebody who has the power of a group like Anonymous might be able to bring down a power grid. And we need to take, uh, you know, take steps to make sure that it, we have an infrastructure that's strong enough for this not to happen. Whether it's, it's Anonymous a, a, or China or... I bet you're right. Anonymous has become sh a short shortcut, yeah. you know, for saying hacker groups. Mm -hmm. And they probably just throw that around loosely. That doesn't mean they're not trying to do a little fear mongering at the same time but right. yeah Let's yeah i think you're go ahead mark uh, i was i was just gonna say i think you guys are exactly right because um it, it's it seems like just a reminder that the u.s looks at um at cyber attacks on the same level as an attack with a bomb or you know as, as some type of act of war i remember reading in the new york times a couple of years ago or a year ago, maybe when all the WikiLeaks stuff came out, and uh, they quoted an anonymous uh, military official saying that, you, almost along these same lines, you come and, and try and shut down our power grid using some digital methods, and maybe we'll come and drop a missile down your smokestacks. And uh, well, there's a real threat to the power grid, right? I mean, that that part is 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 true. That everybody talks about how possible it would be for the power grid to be taken down given the current state of security. So I think it's it's fair to focus a priority on securing that power grid. Maybe NSA Director Alexander feels like to get the attention of the people he's talking to, he has to wave the flag of Al-Qaeda and Anonymous because those are headline-getting names. I don't know. Well, and, and groups that people are fearful of yeah, because exactly. they keep hitting them, um, you know, from uh, left field. Let's move on to the news fuse.
You know, SkyDrive gets overlooked. It's a pretty good cloud system, and Microsoft is improving it. Liveside.net published pictures showing that SkyDrive will support open document formats. There will be Windows and Mac apps to access SkyDrive and also support files up to 300 megabytes in size via web upload. That's up from 100 megabytes. Meanwhile, Gemind reports Microsoft will offer additional storage for a fee, 20 gigabytes for $10, 50 for $25, and 100 gigabytes for $50 per year. Those are all per year. That's uh, capacity is in addition to the free 25 gigabytes you get when you sign up for SkyDrive in the first place. Those, uh, those rates are better than uh, Dropbox. They are. Much better. This demo looked at the top 110 apps that are both on the Amazon App Store and the Android market and found that 42 of them make more money on Amazon's App Store, which means that approximately 62% of apps make more money with Android market. However, Distimo also found that roughly 50% of Amazon's apps are not available on Android market. Apple removed a 99 cent app, uh, game, Pokemon Yellow, from the App Store because it turns out it was an unlicensed game by House of Anime and not Nintendo. The app was first noticed by Ars Technica, which also reports the app was just really a collection of YouTube videos and Pokemon news. It wasn't even a game. On top of that, the review said the app was crashy. So it was a piece of junk and it didn't even work. <laughs> Canonical announced Ubuntu for Android. Now, here's how it would work. You'd dock your Android phone, and then you'd be brought to a full desktop version of Ubuntu. The distro would include Chromium, Thunderbird, VLC, and more. The desktop will also integrate things like contacts, calendar, and messages from your Android setup. Canonical will show a demo at Mobile World Congress. You might not be able to get real-time access to tweets via Google, but Twitter has announced a deal where Russian search engine Yandex is going to gain access to Twitter's Firehose. Yandex will display real-time information in its search results with the partnership. This site owns approximately 60% of the search engine market in Russia and 2.8% of the global market. Bloomberg reports Samsung will spin off its LCD division as the Samsung Display Company on the 1st of April. Samsung's LCD... LCD division lost over $600 million last year. A Samsung spokesperson says that the company may merge its LCD and OLED operations in the future. And Samsung isn't waiting until Mobile World Congress to introduce some new phones. The company announced the Galaxy Mini 2 and the Galaxy Ace. Both are positioned as entry-level phones and run gingerbread. The Mini 2 has an 800 megahertz processor. The Ace 2 will have an 800 megahertz dual-core processor. Pricing wasn't announced, but the Mini 2 will hit France in March. And the Ace 2 is expected in the UK in April. Why do you say we talk more about phones? Yeah, why not? All right. LG announced three new handsets, two of which will run Android 4.0. So first, the ice cream sandwich phones. The LG Optimus L5 will have a 4-inch screen. The Optimus L7 will have a 4.3-inch uh, screen. Internal specs, we don't know those yet. But the gingerbread oddball is the L3 with a kind of small 3.2-inch screen. Expect the phones to launch during the first half of this year. I'm still waiting for somebody to write the first L7 joke about it being a square. But anyway. Wasn't that a girl group in the 90s? It might have been. Pretend that we're dead. (laughs) Analytics company Kantar World Final Comtech says Android has 36.9% of the UK smartphone market as of the end of January 2012. Last year at the same time, Android had 20.1%. iOS has 28.5%, losing a little under 1% over the year. And in somewhat good news for RIM, uh, it still has 18.1% of the UK smart, uh, smartphone base. So. On to the randomizer. Randomizer. The Verge has a story from Lee, or about Lee von Kraus. He's nearsighted, but no, glasses are not good enough for him. He wants to continue to squint. But squinting so hard, he has created a device that he will attach to his head that will squint for him. It uses a motor from an old CD player, okay, and the control circuit's taped to his hand. So it's a pulley system that stretches the skin of his eyelid, ba- eyelid back so he can see better. Ugh. Now, he can wear contacts, you know, or he can get glasses. his mirrors to things. I mean, obviously. LASIK? For- that's, not, that's not an option for him. I mean, you got to wear this thing. Make any sense, Mark? This guy is going to get all the ladies when he takes us to the bar. <laughs> Let me show you my squinted source. I mean, it's a good conversation piece. I'll give him that. Well, if you wear that and those you know, purported Google, Google goggles so you can actually have augmented reality while this is pulling back, I mean, you're going to look like a stud, I think. Maybe you should... Maybe he's had so much Botox that he can't squint. I don't Ooh. think squinting is good for you. I don't know. I'm not an eye doctor, but I think 
Squinting is probably I mean, like if you a should, machine does it's it. It's a okay. natural thing you do when you're out in the sun, right? You know, but I'm, I'm just saying, like squinting to... when your eyes. Yeah, doesn't are... it give you a headache or something? Yeah, I don't think it's. I and then having a machine squint. Well, but I think you. that's because you're using your muscles, and this relaxes your muscles. I, I'm saying squinting to overcome a uh, an, uh, an eyeball deficiency is probably not. Well, good. maybe the machine <laughs> could automatically unsquint so you can not hurt yourself every now and then. Like, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't so know. many questions about the squintosaurus. <laughs> None of them will be answered. Answered in the calendar. <laughs> That's right. We will tell you though that the PlayStation Vita is shipping in the U.S. and the U.K. tomorrow, February twenty second. Uh, also, the extradition request for Mega Upload founder Kim dot com was expected to be filed tomorrow, but guess what? He made bail, so we're going to have another bail hearing. Uh, he is deemed not a flight risk, so the extradition is Does put off until wings. March second. Yeah. SoftBank is launching a 110 megabit per second 4G network in Japan this week. This is AXGP, which is cross compatible with LTE that's rolling out across China and in the US via Clearwire. It's the TD LTE. China Telecom. That's the real LTE, by the way. Yeah, That's yeah. the one that originally was the only one that was right. supposed to be called You should call LTE. it OG LTE. TD LTE. Or 4G, I should say. Or four, yeah. 4G LTE. That's actually 4G. Wow. It's the real one. China Telecom is getting the iPhone in March. That was announced today. And finally, happy birthday, Zelda. Nintendo released the original game for its Famicom console in Japan on February 21st, 1986. Yay. I love Zelda. Happy birthday, Zelda. Happy birthday, Zelda. Love it. Let's check what's incoming. Incoming message. Got a call. Actually, a SoundCloud upload from Clayton. Hey, guys. This is Clayton. I grew up in rural Oklahoma, and where I grew up, we do have a internet-providing cooperative, Pioneer Telephone. They provide telephone, landline, television service, as well as wireless. So... Uh, in response to your caller, yeah, that's a great idea. It worked out really well for uh, the area I grew up in. Thanks. Bye. So get your co-op involved. If there's an electric co-op or a telephone co-op already, maybe if they don't do it, you can convince them to start providing Internet service as long as it doesn't run afoul of your local legislation. Thanks for that uh, call, Clayton. I also got an email from Eric Jansen in Sweden who's talking about municipally provided Internet. Uh, in his town in Lund, Sweden, they pay approximately $8 per month for 100 megabit per second internet. And he's, if he's not happy with his current provider, he can switch the next month without any fees or downtime. Just thought you might find it interesting to hear of an example where municipal internet is working amazingly good. And that's the thing. The municipality provided the pipes, and then there's competition on those pipes, which keeps the price down and makes it easy to switch. I'm extremely jealous of $8. $8 no per month for 100 megabits per second. And the companies are making money, apparently. Yeah, this guy's just showing off. Yeah, jerk. Eric Jansen. <laughs> Fast. Whatever. Swedish Jansen. clean internet. <laughs> it's still really dark in the winter. <laughs> we do love you, though. We All do. right, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. You can uh, vote on stories that you would like to see on the show at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Please go join the 4,788 people who are part of our daily lineup creation at technewstoday.reddit.com. Mark, thanks again uh, for joining us. Always good to have you along and tell people about your new book. Um, yeah, it's a, about Steve Jobs sending emails to people. It's called Letters to Steve. It's on Amazon and iBooks. And I uh, worked on it for about a year and it came out a few months ago. So check it out. Congratulations on that. Go check them out. Markmillion.com is the place to find all things Mark Million. And that's it for us. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, tnt at twit.tv, or give us a call. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Paul Spain from New Zealand joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.